Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. Cooking content is one of those things almost everyone can agree on. If my folks are visiting and we just want to watch TV or something, we'll put on a cooking show. My YouTube algorithm and my wife's are pretty much worlds apart, except for the cooking channels we like. You, you get the point. Today on the pod, we've got two cooking stars out with cookbooks. In a bit, we'll hear from Food Network star Cartier Brown talking about her Gullah Geechee roots. But first... I've learned not to ask my mom for measurements when she's teaching me a dish. I'll be like, Ma, how much of whatever should I add? And she'll be like, some or a little. Like, bro, how much is a little? But she comes from the school of thought that you season based off vibes. And she's not alone. TikTok cooking star Tabitha Brown has a cookbook called Cooking from the Spirit that has no hard measurements because she says in this interview with NPR's Michelle Martin that she wants to teach cooks how to trust themselves in the kitchen. Tabitha Brown spent years trying to make it as an actress, grabbing small parts here and there, before she started making cooking videos online. She didn't expect much to come of it. She was really just looking for a way to have fun and share what she'd figured out about making tasty vegan meals. But it turns out that fun-loving mom-hug persona has earned her a following in all kinds of spaces. Nearly 5 million followers on TikTok alone, a Food Network TV show, a kids show on YouTube TV, a line of spices, a best-selling memoir, a clothing and home goods line at Target, and now a cookbook. It's called Cooking from the Spirit, Easy, Delicious, and Joyful Plant-Based Inspirations. And she says it all started one day while driving for Uber between acting gigs. She went to Whole Foods, got a sandwich with vegan bacon, and the rest, as they say, well, she'll tell it. And I did a review of the sandwich sitting in my car while I was on my break. And I went on back to driving you know, Uber. And when I got home and turned my notifications on, my phone was like going crazy. And (laughs) that video on Facebook had like 50,000 plus views. And I was like, wait a minute, who in the world is watching this video? The next morning had like a hundred plus thousand. I told my husband, I was like, I think I'm going viral. He was like, well, what does that mean? I was like, I don't know. And so (laughs) uh, in, in four days, Whole Foods reached out and they were like, we saw your video on Facebook. We would love to work with you. And I became their brand ambassador. And Went on to do like several campaigns with them over the years and travel the country until 2020 when I got on TikTok. Um, When I got on TikTok, of course, I didn't think I should be on TikTok because I thought that was for the kids, right? But again, my daughter was like, mom, you need to get on TikTok. Because in March of 2020, I had like 500,000 followers on Facebook and I had like 200,000 on Instagram. So I'm like, girl, I'm doing good. She's like, no, if you get on TikTok, you'd be like the TikTok mom. You could do your vegan recipes. You could do your inspirational talks and everybody will love you. I was like, girl, I don't know about that. But I did. And in the first 30 days, I had a million followers. And a week later, I had 2 million. And of course, it just continued to grow. And I just was like, oh my Lord, these people like me just for me, just for being tab. And um, I just continued to show up as me. So if you don't mind a little bit, you talk about this in the in the intro to the book about how you were really feeling under the weather for a while, like you felt kind of chronically ill. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until you turned to a plant based diet, not not on a whim, really kind of out of desperation, because nothing else was really working. Mm-hmm. And you started feeling better immediately. Was it hard? I mean, you talk about this in the book, but for people who haven't seen it yet, you talk about how a lot of people think about veganism or a plant forward diet as what they're giving up. You don't see it that way. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm from the South and I I grew up in in Eden, North Carolina, child. So I ate everything. (laughs) And when I decided to do the 30 day vegan challenge, you know, because I'd had this headache in the back of my head and chronic pain, chronic fatigue for one year and seven months. Can you imagine I had a headache every day for a year and seven months? It never subsided. Pain became my new normal. And so when I started to do this vegan journey and after 10 days, my headache disappeared that I'd had every day for a year and seven months. I tried every drug, every steroid, every injection that the doctor offered me and nothing helped. I went vegan, and in 10 days, the headache disappeared. I was like, I just gave myself something, and my body enjoys it. My body is telling me more of this and less of the other stuff that I was doing. Now, am I going to say I I didn't have cravings, and I don't still crave crab legs every now and then because that was my favorite thing? (laughs) Absolutely. But to have life, to have a pain-free life, 
to have the joy that I have now, nothing is worth that. There's not a plate of food that is worth my joy or my pain-free life. So let's talk about the book. It's called Cooking from the Spirit. It's full of plant-forward recipes, but it doesn't have something that a lot of people might expect, which is measurements per se. Tell people why it is that you do it that way. When I learned to cook, I was already in my early 20s. And my granny and my mom and my aunts would have to tell me over the phone how to do certain things because I didn't know how to cook. And so they would just say, look, you just put enough in there to where you feel like it's all right. Trust yourself, you know, <laughs> and and okay. and that's your spirit. You got to trust your spirit, honey, as you put them ingredients in there. And I messed up many meals in the beginning because I didn't know myself that well. I had to get to know myself in the kitchen. So I always tell people, if you need a recipe with measurements, every single time you cook, you don't trust yourself. So this book is to help you learn to trust yourself more in the kitchen so that you can also trust yourself more in your life. Like, for example, there's this recipe I just happened to open up to sweet potato pancakes. And you say, these amounts are approximate to make about 10 four inch pancakes, but still trust your spirit as you go. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you say that throughout the book. So it's terrible to make you choose among, but is there is there a particular recipe that just is a favorite of yours to make? I really love my mama's meatloaf because it just takes me back to a time when I used to, you know, watch my mama cook in the kitchen or smell it when I would come in and she would always have like potatoes and green beans and this perfect ketchup sauce <laughs> on the top that would just be so good on top of this meatloaf. And I remember when I went vegan, I was like, oh, Lord, I ain't going to be able to have that meatloaf anymore. And, of course, I figured out how to make it the vegan way. And I was like, oh, wait, I can have it. I can have anything that I used to have. I can just use new ingredients. So those are a couple of my favorites. So what about when you're short on time? We've been asking cookbook authors like yourself what dishes they make when mm -hmm. they're in a pinch and they need to throw something together. So I know you've been there with, you know, a family, grown yeah. family and all the stuff going on. Are there one or two recipes from the book that, that are sort of like a go-to if you're short on time? If you are short on time, depending, you know, what time of day it is. First of all, like if you need to be fulfilled, but you want something delicious and quick, avocado toast is your friend. <laughs> I love avocado. Everybody has access to bread and avocados. I load mine up. One of my other things that I love is a quesadilla. Spinach, mushrooms, cheese, honey. Put it on the, you know, on your skillet. All you're doing is flipping it one or two times, honey, and you're done in like five minutes. So those are like quick meals that you can grab and go. So before we let you go, and again, congratulations on everything. I mean, you do such exude this sense of... Um joy and gratitude and also kindness. Like I was watching one of your videos the other day where you just said, look, you know, how are you doing? And I know you're not doing okay. And I thought that was so interesting. A number of friends of mine just pointed that out to me that they had played that one over and over again. It was one that you're not wearing any makeup. You're kind of very relaxed. It's almost as if you're kind of stretched out someplace on a, on the couch and just t talking to folks. It was uh, it was such a contrast to the other ones where you're just so up and happy and you're dressed up mm -hmm. and doing fun stuff. I just was wondering what made you feel that you wanted to deliver that particular message on that day. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, absolutely. I do those. And I did them a lot during the pandemic. Um, during my sickness, right, I call that my own personal pandemic where life felt like it was touch and go for a while. And prior to that, even in pursuing something for a long time and hearing no all the time and feeling stuck, I know what those feelings feel like. But I know at night is when our mind really moves and sometimes can take us on the spin. And I pray at night and I always ask God, give me what I need to say to people. And that's the words that he gave me to say. And so... For me, I'm always talking to one person. So when I do my videos, and especially inspirational or encouraging videos, I'm always holding my phone very close to my face because I want people to feel like I'm only talking to you in this moment. I don't care how many people actually watch the video. I'm only talking to the one person who needs it. And sometimes people just need a friend to remind them that, it's all right that you ain't all right right now, you know, but it's going to get better. And I just want people to hold on and not give up 
and I'm proof of that. And so that's why I did that video that night. Even on tour, I was on tour. You know, I've been on tour the last two weeks. Um, I was in my hotel room and after prayer, that's what God gave me. And I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta reach somebody. And so I'm grateful that I did. And I'm always obedient to the spirit. And I always do those videos for that reason. Hmm. Tabitha Brown, her cookbook, Cooking from the Spirit, Easy, Delicious, and Joyful Plant-Based Inspirations is out now. Tabitha Brown, it's been so great talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you, honey. According to Cartier Brown, there's a Gullah Geechee saying that goes, we live by the land and we live by the sea, meaning food comes from what's around, what's in season. Her new cookbook, The Way Home, is a pretty expansive look into the food traditions of the Gullah Geechee people found in South Carolina. And she told Here and Now Celeste Headley how they were doing farm to table way before that trendy new spot by you that you've been meaning to check out and is only pretty okay at best we're doing it. For Food Network fans, South Carolina chef Cartier Brown is a familiar face. She's appeared on Beat Bobby Flay, Farmhouse Rules, and the Spring Baking Championship. Cartier Brown is also the host of her own show, Delicious Miss Brown, where she introduces viewers to the food of her home, Charleston's Sea Islands, as well as her spin on family recipes like macaroni and cheese. Look at that. It looks like my grandma's. It actually looks a little better. It looks good. (laughs) Grandma, you didn't hear that. Now Cartier Brown has a new cookbook. It's called The Way Home. And Cartier Brown joins me to talk about it. Welcome. Hi, Celeste. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, It's a pleasure. Your book is called The Way Home. So many great pictures in here, not just of food either. Um, Mm -hmm. Home for you is the Sea Islands of Charleston. Many listeners may not be familiar with that area. Can you tell us a little bit about your home and what makes it so special? Yes. So my family is from a little small island in a cluster of islands off the coast of South Carolina. Wadmala is where my family is from. It's where slaves were brought on the transatlantic slave trade because settlers in that area saw that um, the area was really great for harvesting the grain rice. And so they knew that the people of West Africa also had this vast knowledge of cultivating rice. In that time, the settlers had issues with um, diseases of the land and they were unable to stay in the sea islands. But because the people of West Africa had grew almost uh, immunity to the types of diseases and things of that area, they were able to stay there in isolation. And so they were able to keep most of their language and their food and the culture. Fast forward generations later, my family also are direct descendants of those enslaved people. That's why it's so special. It's an area where where for a long time it was untouched and it was it still is very beautiful and it's home to to Gullah Geechee people so that's why it's extremely special to me it is a gorgeous area um and yes. the Gullah Geechee people and that area in particular still maintains those strong roots culturally to West Africa So much of African-American food comes from um, this tradition of making do with what you have. They weren't given the best cuts of meat, right? They were, you know, weren't always given the freshest vegetables or fruits. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wonder if you could explain the difference between what I think of, what others may think of as African-American food and Gullah Geechee food. Okay, so I'm glad you you brought that up because when you think about Southern food or African-American or soul food in general, you think that, oh, it's deep fried. It's only macaroni and cheese. It's only collard greens swimming in some type of smoked meat. But Gullah Geechee food is not that. I mean, it is some of that, but the original type of Gullah Geechee food is where food was stewed and cooked in one large pot a lot of things were not deep fried because it, it, it honestly getting cooking oil and things of that sort was not accessible to the people of the Sea Islands. There were not major grocery stores or chains or anything like that. Gullah Geechee food is, is we have the saying, we live by the land and we live by the sea. Whatever you grow on your land, whatever you catch in the sea, you eat. And so a lot of our food is very fresh. It's actually farm to table. Before farm to table became a fad or a thing, Gullah Geechee people were doing this out of necessity. Um, But that's the biggest difference. It's not all about deep frying and having crazy amounts of butter. It's all about seasonality and fresh ingredients with little 
to nothing. Like you said, like sometimes giving the, the scraps of meat and making something wonderful from that. You talk a lot about your mother and your grandmother and their influence on you and their cooking and sitting in the kitchen with your mom on Sundays. But it sounds like your grandmother wanted you to keep your fingers off of her cooking. <laughs> she, she didn't want you interfering while she was in there. So how did you pick up their habits, the, their style of cooking? So number one, I think it's just instilled in me. It's just one of those things like you're just born with it. Um, but my grandmother, yes, she didn't believe in having kids. Well, she says mix up or mix up in the <laughs> in the kitchen because it's just a place where she did her thing. It was her area. And so she would allow me to sit at her little two seater she used to have in her kitchen. And I would watch from there and I would just ask a ton of questions. I was a very inquisitive child. And so I would always ask her like, well, why are you putting that? in there what's that or how do you make this and so I guess all of those questions over the years just kind of stayed with me and and so as as soon as I was able to cook in the kitchen um, when they allowed me to I kind of already knew what I was doing because I've watched for so long so you have in, uh, recipes like she crab soup uh, mm -hmm. Low Country Crab Cakes. You've got the Low Country Cheese Steak with Have Mercy Sauce. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> these, some of these may be terms people may not be a, a aware of, things like Low Country, or they may even not understand what a, what a she crab is. Um, yes. Can you tell me a little bit about how you're sort of carrying on the tradition of the Gullah Geechee people and your own family, even in the, the recipes you've chosen and your ingredients? I tell people all the time, you got to come to the low country to experience it. And they're like, what's the low country? I'm like, you know, we, we're kind of below sea level here. <laughs> and, and that's why, you know, we're really close to the, to the ocean and we, we eat a lot of seafood and we eat a lot of okra and rice and things of that sort. And so shaping a cookbook around that was so important to me because it is a part of my everyday life. And it is the fabric of who I am, not only as a chef, but as a person. I want to talk about some of the recipes themselves. And I have to start with our producer's favorite. Emiko mm -hmm. has made your aunt's recipe for lemon cake. And she yes. says it's a huge hit with her neighbors, which means she's nice enough to share something like that. I'm not sure <laughs> I am. Um, but it uses lemon lime soda. It uses, you know, Sprite. How does that yes. work in a recipe? So the Sprite acts as a like a dough conditioner and also a leavener because um, it doesn't have baking soda or anything else in the, the recipe so that the carbonation in the um, lemon lime soda acts as a leavener. So it gives the rise and it also gives that soft texture to uh, the recipe. And also, I mean, it tastes like lemon. So, <laughs> so you get that citrus flavor and then you also get um, some of the softening agents in it. So it's just... It's a home run. I mean, I'm not the first to invent lemon lime soda cake, but Auntie C's recipe is just like, it's a no brainer. And I'm glad she allowed me to, that was one of the first recipes I made on the show. And I perfected it and I said, I, you know, I have to share this with the world. And I think it's one of, if not my most reviewed and loved recipe. Really? You yes. also have, um, I mean, there's a bunch, if I, we would be here all day if I was going to go through the recipes that I had um, marked for me to try. Um, but there's <laughs> things that you, that, you know, are relatively quick to cook, but they are so full of different flavorings. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of things like your barbecue shrimp, which is when I say barbecue, people are going to think it's covered in barbecue sauce. That is not what this is. So how do you create that sort of taste with mm -hmm. all these different spices that you use? So what I have to, I have to give credit to the Creole and Cajun culture. We are very closely related to the people of New Orleans as far as our cooking style and the way that we prepare foods. And so my love of Cajun and Creole cooking kind of gave birth to this recipe. So it's just creating all of these spices with, you know, the um, the paprika and, and the cayenne and things of that sort. And then, you know, creating this almost this like gravy, which is kind of like why they call it a barbecue. It has that smoky essence of a barbecue sauce, but it's also like a gravy. Um, and it's one of those things that you just got to like pill and eat is <laughs> you get messy, but it's an experience and it's just, it's delicious. I have to also talk about mac and cheese because frankly, coming from a family, um, a black family that came out of Georgia and then Arkansas mm -hmm. and Mississippi, that mm -hmm. mac and cheese recipe is often the very first thing they will check. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> to yep. decide whether this is a good, a good cookbook or not. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> tell me about your approach to mac and cheese. I have several ways of making macaroni and cheese, but my tried and true recipe is the one that um, I kind of elevate it. It's my grandmother's. It's old school. It uses um, the extra sharp cheddar cheese. You got to cut those up in blocks. You got to hand shred the cheese. You got to add a, a good amount of butter and you got to add your cream and your eggs. Eggs are so important. That's a big debate um, around town to use eggs yeah. or to not use eggs. Mm -mm, you got to use eggs over here <laughs> for this particular old school, right. old fashioned way of making Southern macaroni and cheese. And then I like to add cream cheese to mine to get it really creamy and, and sour cream. velvety and sour cream because it adds a little twang. It, the sour cream just pairs really well with the sharpness of that cheddar. It's it's just that's another one of my very most popular recipes is that macaroni and cheese. Okay, so for someone who is just beginning to experiment, maybe this type of food is unfamiliar to them, mm -hmm. what recipe would you say, okay, try this first? Because I want people to get very familiar with low country cooking, this is going to sound a little off, but I would say learn how to perfect a pot of rice. Mm. Because there's a lot of people and I meet a lot of people that always say, I can't cook rice. So I have a, a, the recipe in the book, The Perfect Pot of Rice. So perfect your, your steamed rice and then all of the other recipes will just, especially in the new gullah section, will just fall into place. Food Network chef Cartier Brown, the new cookbook is called The Way Home, a celebration of Sea Island food and family with over 100 recipes. We didn't even talk about that. Uh, Cartier <laughs> Brown, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Celeste, for having me. This was a, a great talk. If you want to check out some of the recipes we've been talking about, go to hereandnow.org. And that's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. If you want more, you can sign up for our newsletter at npr.org slash newsletter slash books. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. The podcast is produced by Isabella Gomez Sarmiento and edited by Megan Sullivan. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. The show elements for this week were produced and edited by Emiko Tamagawa, Dee Parvaz, Phil Harrell, Rena Advani, Samantha Balaban, Melissa Gray, Carly Rubin, Tinby Ermias, and Lennon Sherborne. Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening. 